Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Michaela Schmidt, a program coordinator here at the Pulitzer Center. Um, as we're waiting for everyone to join, please feel free to let us know where you're listening in from in the chat. If you haven't joined us before, the Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism organization um, focused around education. We support more than 170 reporting projects each year in collaboration with news outlets around the world and work with classrooms with the mission to elevate public engagement around these issues. While we're based in Washington, D.C., our staff and our work are global. A few logistics before we begin our conversation today. You'll see a Q&A icon on your screen. You can begin adding your questions for our speakers at any time throughout the discussion. There is also a chat icon on your screen. We'd appreciate if you use the chat box for specific tech issues. We also want you to know that we're recording the session and we will post it online afterwards. And one other note, please stay a little bit longer after the session ends to participate in a brief survey. Now I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Christine Spoller, Pulitzer Center Climate and Labor Editor. Christine Spoller has been a journalist for decades, working as a writer, correspondent, and editor on investigations and in conflict zones. Most recently, she was international business editor for the New York Times and the investigations editor for the Financial Times based in London and executive editor of Kaiser Health News based in Washington, DC. She continues to write for Kaiser Health News, The Washington Post, and National Geographic. She has been based in Ljubljana, Warsaw, Jerusalem, Rome, Cairo, London, Los Angeles, New York, and Washington. Thank you, Michaela. Um, I am so pleased to be here, and we are so pleased to have Pula. might have lost Christine there to some technical difficulties. We will give her just a minute, see if she's able to rejoin here. All right, well, while we see if Christine's able to rejoin, um, Ryan, would you like to go ahead and just start by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your reporting on the hidden lives of our blue jeans? Yeah, sure. So my name is Ryan Lenora Brown. I'm a freelance reporter based in Johannesburg, South Africa. I've been based here for about a decade. Um, I'm formerly the Africa correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor. And this project looks at um, the ways in which Africa is implicated in the West's hunger for cheap, plentiful clothing. Um, so looking both at uh, Africans as the people who make our clothes and Africa as the ultimate resting place for our clothes when we're done with them um, and the life cycle uh, of our clothes and um, my reporting was focused in Lesotho, which is a small country inside of South Africa that has a very large garment industry that produces for a lot of American brands. Well, we have a cat with us. It asked me to be a panelist. That's my kitty Brandy, but she's just visiting. She's uh, in the the afterlife, but she's here to promote fa no fast fashion. My name's Susan. Is it? A, they asked me to be a panelist. I'm not is sure okay? I Zoom did that. I think we're having some technical oh, I'm glitches sorry. How again. Do I un panelists. I'm sorry. Will, oh my gosh. No, you're good. I will take a look at that. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Hi from Northern California and Brandy. Okay. I'm glad right, you're I'm joining now. Again. Okay. Thank you for having it. Bye. Okay. Um, and Sammy, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the Orr Foundation? You, you're muted. Hi. Hi. <laughs> My name is um, Sammy Oteng. I'm calling in today from Accra, Ghana. 
uh, which is where I'm from. Um, I work as the senior community engagement manager at the All Foundation. And the All Foundation is a non-profit based here in Ghana in the US. And we work at the intersection of um, environmental justice, um, education, and fashion development. Um, and all of this is to catalyze um, a justice-led circular economy within the secondhand trading um, economy in, in Ghana and then I guess um, other parts of, of the world. Um, our work at the All Foundation, as I mentioned before, really cuts across different um, fields. Um, but most of our work is based around um, the Cantamanto secondhand clothing market, which is the largest secondhand clothing market in West Africa, be it the world. Um, Cantamanto alone has 30,000 30, um, registered workers and sees around 50 million garments like each week. And just for context, the Ghana, like the Ghanaian um, citizenship or the people that live in Ghana is just around 32 million people. So to think that like a country of this number sees 15 million garments each week is already like a broad disconnect. So our work here um, is first of all, finding alternatives as the name of the organization, the OR is finding like better alternatives for all of these um, injustices and then, like exploitation that goes around this trade. Um, another part of our work is also um, trying to find new pathways for these textile waste. So where I'm calling from right now is our No More Fast Fashion Lab, which is our office, is also our R&D space where we bring in textile waste from the market directly and then try to remanufacture them into new um, viable products. Great, and we're excited to hear a little bit more about that as we continue on in this conversation. Um, Ryan, I'm curious to hear what started your interest in um, this story? Like, how did you first discover it as a journalist? Well, I, I sort of came at it sideways in that uh, it was a personal interest in thrifting that got me into the topic. Um, during the pandemic, I got very into thrifting in Johannesburg, and there is a particular place in Johannesburg, like there is in a lot of African cities, a big open air market where secondhand clothes are sold. Um, and I think, you know, I went in initially just to buy things for myself. Um, but when I started looking around, it, I couldn't help but have sort of my journalistic curious, curiosity picked by this whole experience, um, because it's just enormous, enormous quantities of secondhand clothes coming from the US and Europe. And I just started to wonder, how does this all get here? And then I started to look sometimes at the, the made in tags that I would see, you know, in the clothes that I was looking at. Um, and once or twice, I saw one that said made in Lesotho. And like I was saying before, Lesotho is this little tiny country of 2 million people that's inside of South Africa. Um, but these clothes that were made in Lesotho, clearly they were not coming from Lesotho to Johannesburg, which is a sort of four or five hour drive. They had clearly made this trip where they had gone to the US, been worn by, bought and worn by people there, donated or otherwise disposed of, and then come back to this region. So made this kind of trip around the world. Um, and that just made me realize, uh, you know, the, the first of all, this just sort of global nature of the clothing industry and the ways in which African countries are now being implicated on both sides of it, like I was saying before, both as the sort of producers of our clothes um, and also as the people responsible for disposing of them at the end of their of their lifespan. Um, so that's what got me interested in the topic. You, I, I, and I, I, I got frozen out of the session for a couple of minutes there. So I'm not sure if you um, gave some of the names for the clothes because yesterday we were talking and there's actually terms for the clothes that you, you were sorting through. Yeah, so, so in South Africa, the markets that these are sold in are called um, quadanusa, which means uh, sort of more or less the, the place of bending over with your bum out, which of course refers to the sort of way in which people, the clothes are laid out in these big bins and then people rummage through them kind of looking for whatever they want. But they, you know, these markets have all different kinds of names all over the continent, all of which tell us something very interesting about the trade and the history of it. Like 
in, in Mozambique, I'm told they're called calamity. The, the markets are called calamity and that's because they have a, an association with disaster relief or aid relief. Um, and in a number of places, including I think Ghana, Sammy can speak to this, they're called dead white man's clothes um, or some variation thereof. So the, even the, yeah, the names of these markets tell an interesting story about um, what's going on here. So Sammy, can you tell us about the, the secondhand market in Ghana? And, and tell us about some of the terms also. Um, and also how you two, you two got together and met in this in, in the exploration of the secondhand market. Sammy, you might be on mute, I'm not sure. Yeah. So here in Ghana, also, as I said before, um, the market here is called Cantamanto. And um, the, the name that we use for secondhand clothing is Bruni Wewu which translates to English as dead white man's clothes. And then the whole idea behind it is like, it's only because there are a lot of white people dead. And so their entire wardrobe is being shipped to our part of the world. That's the only way it makes sense to most of people. So that's one name we have. Another name most people have for it too is Bend Down Boutique, which is very much similar to um, what Ryan just explained. Because what happens is that most of the clothes are sold on the floor. So people have to bend down to pick up or make their selections for this clothing. And so they call them Bend Down Boutique. Another name that we also hear very much is Fools, which is, uh, Fools is also like a very um, slang, local slang for um, anything secondhand or anything that has been used before. And you have grown up with these markets your entire life. Yeah. Um, can you describe to me a secondhand clothes market in Ghana? How did the clothes come in? You know, yeah. how are they distributed? And yeah. um, and some of the risks, I, I guess there is a debt risk to people who mm -hmm. deal with this trade. Yeah, that is very true. So while Cantamanto is like the largest um, secondhand clothing space within um, the Ghana and most likely all of Africa, there are so many other secondhand market hubs across the country. So right up from the north down to the side, there are so many little um, markets that you find. But Cantamanto is the largest. And the way that these markets work, um, um, talking about Cantamanto, the, the clothing are uh, um, imported and brought into the country to the harbor, and then they are moved by trucks into Cantamanto. So the harbor is about uh, two to three hours drive from the market itself, and the market is found in the central business district of Accra, which is where most of the ministries and then the government buildings are found. So here in the market, the, the trucks come and then they offload the bills, which are the name given to the compacted or the packed clothes. So these bills come and then usually weigh around 55 kg. They come and then they are offloaded. And then on Thursdays, um, that is when the retailers, the people who sell the clothing in the market, go to the imported side of the market where the bills are stored and then buy them into their side of the market to open them and then sell. Um, the way that it, 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 it works is that they open the bills without having knowledge of the content of the bill. So then they invest their money into getting these bills. And sometimes in return, they open the bills and it's just full of trash or basically on um, items that has no saleable value. And in instances like this, it literally leaves them into a dust cycle such that if you're investing into a business that you don't know what you're getting and you invest your money and get no profit, what happens is that the importers who are the people these retailers get the bills from, they go and then get a new batch of bill. And so they have to pay back what they have already bought and could not pay or get any profit from. So in the end, it just really like sips them deeper into a death cycle where they always have to pay like, you know, for what they have already invested in from um, weeks or months ago. Sammy, how many people, what percentage of the population is involved where you are in Accra in, in the secondhand clothing trade? Okay, so there's... Um, in the market, there are um, associations and then officially and formally by association, there are 30,000 registered workers in Cantamanto. But like I can tell you here, right here now that there's probably almost double that number in Cantamanto because there are a lot of people who work there that are unregistered. And just to give you context, like these people, most of these people are not formally trained or even like basically are familiar with the whole um, sustainable fashion um, community or space. Some of those people who are doing this because they don't, they do not have jobs. Most of these people are doing this because naturally that's their way of life. They are used to upcycling their own clothing from home and then they are applying the same skills to what as they find in the market. 
And you're a trained fashion designer and those clothes yeah. came in and they were your source of material for designs. Where did they, what did they play in your life, this kind of trade? Yeah. So um, growing up personally, I had um, uh, like a sort of like a relationship with, with um, secondhand clothing when I was around um, 11 or 12. That was when my big sister introduced me to like secondhand clothing and how to shop. Prior to that, I was all my clothes were tailor made. Um, my mom makes makes clothes. My mom is a, a seamstress, so she used to make my shirts and my pants and everything. But I think when I was just about entering teenagehood, that's when my sister introduced me to like all of these secondhand clothing and everything. So I've always been used to it. But it wasn't until when I started gaining interest in fashion generally, and I entered fashion school, then I started looking at how I can use like these excess clothing into my practice as well. So almost like all my um, collections and projects work that I worked on school in fashion school, they were all um, sourced and the materials came from the second markets. So Sammy, you have a background in fashion and that's how yeah. you got interested. Ryan, I am thinking you're, you're likely not a fashionista. So what, what about the fashion trade and what you saw, you know, in Lesotho and other places made you think this is a very big story and it's a story that that has ripples to the U.S. and to other countries? Yeah, so when I, you know, when I got curious about the sort of scale on which um, the secondhand clothing trade exists and then also sort of African countries involvement in the garment industry, I started looking into the statistics um, and was actually quite surprised to find out that the global fashion industry is responsible for 10% of emissions, more than air travel. Um, it's one of the biggest polluters in the world. Um, so, you know, what we do with our clothes, how we buy clothes, uh, how we dispose of them is actually a, a topic with huge implications for everyone. Um, and then just for me personally, as a reporter, my style of reporting is that I really like to do kind of human level stories about these big picture issues. Because I think even from what I've just said, you know, that's kind of an overwhelming kind of statistic, right? Responsible for 10% of all global emissions. You know, it's the kind of statistic that's almost so big that you wanna turn away from it because what are you possibly gonna do with that? Um, so I was looking for ways in which to sort of quote unquote humanize this story um, and make it real to people. And so um, actually getting sort of ground level and talking to garment workers and hearing their experiences and talking to traders and hearing their experiences uh, was the way that I decided to do that. And the, from, the, from the first story that you did, were you seeing that the fashion industry was open to your questions, resistant? How hard was it to get answers about why the industry, you know, works the way it does? Um, I mean, the fashion industry, fa uh, fashion companies have very uh, good PR in the sense that they're able to maintain a lot of distance, both from the way that their products are produced and from what happens to them at the end of their life. And on the production side, it's because they contract out to factories uh, that they don't own. Um, and so that's why you very often hear, you know, if there's bad labor practices in a factory or something, a brand will say, oh, we're so sorry, we didn't know, we're gonna drop that factory now. Um, but there's this way in which they're able to put distance between themselves and the problem um, by doing that. Um, you know, and making it sort of, and on the other end, with, in terms of how much people buy and what they do with it, making it a question of personal responsibility versus a corporate responsibility. And we've seen this over a 25 year period change, both in degree and in quality of the fabric itself. Um, can Ryan, can you talk about that? And then, then Sammy, can you talk about that? What you saw on the ground as somebody living there? But Ryan, can you start first with a little bit of the history? Yeah, sure. I mean, so it won't come as a surprise to anyone who's sort of seen vintage clothes versus interacted with clothes that you can buy in shops now. Um, clothing used to be made in a much more durable way. Um, and that's because people used to, A, spend a lot more of their money on individual clothing items, keep them for a lot longer and buy 
maybe at most seasonally. So, you know, you'd buy something for the winter, you'd buy something for the summer. But what started happening sort of 20 or 30 years ago is that companies, fashion companies started picking up the pace of production so that people would want to come into the stores more often. So instead of swapping things out seasonally, they would swap things out monthly or even weekly. And that's sort of where you get what, you know, what is now called fast fashion, um, which was sort of pioneered by companies like The Gap in the 1990s, but is now associated, you know, with sort of H&M, Zara's, Forever 21's, et cetera, of the world. And that's these companies that are just constantly, constantly churning out new styles so that you always want to go back, you always want to buy new things. And the result is that actually globally, clothing production has doubled since the year 2000. Um, the, the scale of the problem is really ballooning as a result of this. And Sammy, what does that mean for the quality of clothes you're seeing in, in Ghana or anywhere else and that, that you go around uh, with the Or Foundation? No. Yeah. So just for reference and then to speak to my work as community engagement, um, speaking to most of the retailers, some of them have been working in the market for over 30 years. And speaking with them, they, they have personally seen and even myself have seen how the quality of clothing has changed, like, you know, over the years. So before, some of the retailers may buy just a bill, one bill of clothing per month. And that was because like the entire bill will have most of premium saleable goods that they can sell at premium price over a period of a month. But here's the case, there's more clothing coming in, but at very, very, very low quality. So in this case, they have to buy more bills in order to get like, you know, good quality, a few good quality ones to sell. But what happens to that also is that um, all of this clothing, like because of how low the quality is, even when they put them out on sale, sometimes them being exposed to natural elements like the sun and even like, you know, the, the wind that blows by deteriorates the quality within a couple of days. So they may pull a garment from the bill that is like, you know, a very brightly colored, maybe blue or red shirt. And then they just pull it out in the sun or they put it out in their stores to, to show or merchandise to their clients. And then within a week, all the colors fade out just because the, the quality is just so low. So that is how bad it has become. And then thinking about like the waste is like all of these people that work in the market space, they, the way the market is built, they are um, wooden stalls that do not have like windows or doors or anything. So if they buy these bills, the, every morning they have to unpack and um, merchandise or arrange all their garments and then by the close of day, pack it again and send it to storage. And every time they have to pay money to pull these clothes into storage. So to, it's almost as if you're buying someone else's waste to and then still pay to store the waste basically. So and then just to uh, what about belts or boots or shoes? Do does that also end up there? Yeah, that that also. So basically, all items of fashion, from shoes to clothes to bags to jewelry, almost everything is is found within the market space. So I can. If, sorry to interrupt, Christine. No, I can no, just please. say a little bit about, about how that happens, if, if people would be interested. So, so if you're sort of living in the US or Europe, for instance, and you have old stuff you don't want anymore, you're doing spring cleaning, whatever, maybe you take it to a Goodwill or some kind of, um, you know, secondhand donation bin or something like that. I mean, this is what I used to always do. And I assumed that then that stuff is then sold in a Goodwill or a Salvation Army or whatever the charity shop that you donate to is. Actually, those places receive so, so much volume of stuff, like such a huge volume of stuff that they sort of pick out the things that are the most, you know, the, the most high fashion or that they think will sell for the most. 10 to 20% of what they get, they keep that and put it in their shops. The other 80 to 90% gets sold on to these textile recyclers who then what they do is they sort through it. They're sort of the middlemen who sort through it and maybe they divide it up into leather belts over here, shoes over here, um, you know, workout leggings here, men's dress shirts here. Um, and then they press them into these cubes, these really compacted cubes. That's what Sammy's talking about when he says bales. Um, and then those bales get sold then onto traders in uh, about 70% of them go to African countries and the rest um, to Asia generally. Um, so that's why, I mean, you do end up with like just, a huge spectrum of 
of strange stuff that people have donated that ends up in these markets. Like in the one in Joburg, I've seen bales of aprons. I've seen bales of rollerblades. I've seen bales of fishing overalls. I mean, you get some really like deep cut stuff from people's wardrobes. And yeah, and, and then please go go ahead, Sammy. Yeah, I was just gonna add a little bit to what Ryan said. That also really speaks to like, you know, how really separate like the global north or like Europe and like, you know, America is very separate from these problems because like you know all of this clothing is coming from like you know all of these countries in the global north but then you don't see like these problems existing in the space and you would walk up like in the streets of Accra and you, you literally see textile waste within the like gutters and stuff and most of this clothing that come in for example if you're sending like winter jackets or like ski um, suits into Ghana, nobody's gonna wear that. Like the Ghanaian climate does not exist to like, you know, accept or uh, for anybody to wear these things. If you went, wear a fair lined leather coat here, you will cook by the time you leave your house. So it also speaks to like the fact that there's really no consciousness around like the stuff that is coming in here. As Ryan said, the good part is taken out and every basically everything that is left is like, you know, shipped down here. Sammy, how did you get involved in in thinking about secondhand clothes, what was, did you have any revelation when you were I, working with design? I really did. Um, personally, I had always like somehow been interested in, you know, um, upcycling and in recycling and sustainability because just around the time that I entered fashion school, it, had, it was just the beginning of, you know, um, sustainability and upcycling becoming a buzzword. So like um, automatically I also sort of like lean into the idea, but what really sort of like became an ep epiphany for me was um, one time I had gone into the market as usual to like, you know, buy and shop for things that I could upcycle. And then I was just there. This was, I think in my second or third year in fashion school. And I was, as I was sitting down, I, it was raining and I had to like, you know, like find shelter from one of the stalls. And there was a puddle of water. And then usually when it rains, you see like, you know, the water puddles and everything. But here's the case that there was, um, here's the case that there was um, like the puddle of water, but you couldn't see any water at all. It was just like, you know, items of polyester clothing in there. And that moment I just looked at it, like people walking back and forth over it. And in my mind, I was like, I am training to be a designer my whole practice, all of my resources, all of these years of like, you know, investing my time and money and everything into this is because I want to create clothing that people wear and people have sentimental value for people who admire. But here is, I'm sitting in a market, seeing all of this clothing around me that people literally don't know what to do with. And there are some literally on the floor that people are walking over. So it made me ask myself a lot of questions. Am I also in this, uh, existing in a country and in, in an industry that is already failing in itself? Am I, like aspiring to be a designer that I make clothes today and then the next day I find you know in some bin somewhere or I find in some gutter somewhere so all of these questions just like kept revisiting me and then I was like there need to be something that I should I can be able to do within my means to not be a part of the problem so basically from that point I started like you know evolving towards the discussion and then at, like asking personally myself some questions and is there a sustainability pathway here are you saying I should never go into H&M or I should never like what is the right way to consume and also well, recy recycle? Yeah. So um, while we all know that all of these fashion fast fashion brands are like, you know, the big corporates and all of these discussions that we are having, the real another real um, understanding that we should have here is the main problem is our attitude towards consumption. So even if, I mean, there are so many people that I've spoken to that have basically all of their wardrobes sold with fast fashion goods. And in the moment they hear conversations like this, they were like, oh, I'm going to read my entire wardrobe and start buying ethical product or start buying secondhand um, product. But that in itself really goes against like the whole discussion here because the idea is being more conscious of your consumption and then valuing what you have, having sentimental, sentimental value for them and making them last as long as possible. Because the truth is, even if we should stop production of clothes right now in this world, I'm pretty sure everyone else will have clothing to wear for the next 10 years without any worry. But here's the case, we have an inbuilt um, system that we like. We constantly need to, to have something. There's almost like 
the fashion industry and fast fashion exist in abundance where there are so many clothing, you know, coming in every, every time. But then there's this system of scarcity that's also built behind it. Like you go into, like you open your, your internet and they're telling you, oh, this is the new item that you need to buy. Otherwise you're missing out. You need to buy this dress to go out tonight. Otherwise, like, you know, the, that boy or that girl won't check you out. You need to buy this garment tomorrow because that's what everyone else is wearing so there's always this idea that you have to buy something new you have to consume something new every time and that is what we have to be looking at how to minimize our consumption that is the real problem and ryan doing this story i think a couple things happened during the pandemic people were going through their closets and cleaning out closets all of us were i think but you doing the story personally have you now changed in any way as a consumer Yeah, so one thing I I became really aware of visiting these factories, and I suppose in a sense this is quite obvious, but um, the making of clothes can't really be mechanized very much. Obviously, people use sewing machines in order to do it, but it takes a lot of human hands and a lot of skilled labor to make any item of clothing that you own, no matter how little you've paid for it. Um, and so now, whenever I sort of look at my clothes, I look at the stitching, you know, I look at the made in tag and I think about the people, the, and mostly it's women, women of color, women in the global south who are making our clothes and try to respect that labor by taking care of things, by tending to my clothes, by mending them when they're, you know, when they are uh, torn instead of throwing them away, um, things like that. Like Sammy's saying, just sort of trying to psychologically change a little bit what my relationship is to to the clothes and, and, and breaking the idea that the relationship is based on how much you paid for it, because I think that's what we're conditioned into, you know? Um, oh, because this Zara top was $10, then it's fine if I only wear it twice and then sort of chuck it away. You know, it didn't cost me that much, but to rather say, well, this was the product of someone's labor, this item traveled around the world to get to me. And I want to sort of tend to it and care for it like it's a thing of value, which it is. And, and let me ask yeah. this, because you both talked about well, women as the, as the labor force for clothes. Can you talk about some of the health risks because of the, the trade, um, the trade that's there of the secondhand clothes? Mm -hmm. And also we talked a little bit about the financial risks and the debt, but what other, what other issues, you know, particularly for women who yeah. are, you know, trying to survive through this. Yeah. So um, speaking on that and how, like, you know, this whole fast fashion, like trade and model really hurts women. Like for me, I always start to try to bring it right from the beginning, talking about garment workers. Most of the garment workers that we know from, like, you know, across the world are mostly women. And moving from the fact that they're women, like it moves down to even the idea of like, we didn't retail in the clothing that I made. Like you go between like a, a men's and then a woman's line. And then you can see that like women may have like a million styles being released within a week. And then like the men have like little, like women have to go through like all the sizing issues and all of that. All of this create like a, a very um, psychological like stress and pressure on women. And to think about down on the ground, most of these women, as I spoke about, going into debt because of all of these um, like, you know, bad quality of build that come in. But also within the Kantamantu space, um, there are women called the Kayaye who are like um, young girls sometimes um, as young as 12 years old, between the ages of 12 and 35. And most of them are climate and economic migrants from the northern part of Ghana into Accra. And then they move in here and then the only work they find out like themselves even being able to do is transporting these 55 kg bills within the market space. And with our research as an organization, we partnered with Nova Wellness Clinic, which is a chiropractic center and checking some of the, like doing assessment on the girls on their spines and their back. We found that some of the girls as young as 13 years old have their spines deteriorated as a 60 year old woman just because they have been carrying literally like, you know, like waste fashion waste from the global north on their backs basically like all day. So if you think about like the health impacts, it goes on and on. And also with the waste that comes in, like, you know, of course it's waste and then it will go into like, you know, landfills and gutters and all of that. And as I said before, like when you live in the global north and certain parts of Europe and in the US, there are, you know, sanitary um, 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 uh, landfills, there are recycling bins and all of that. So you don't really see the problem like, like 
face on and hands on. But here's the case like here, there are no sanitary landfills. So some of these clothing are dumped in communities where people actually live. And we all know the health implications that comes with this cholera, um, malaria, like, you know, a whole, of, a whole like array of diseases that may be infected um, or come from, from these waste. And another thing that happens is that some of these people that live in these co communities, mostly women and in the Cairo women that I just spoke about, um, get disenfranchised um, by these ways because they are blamed that they are the ones causing this problem. But we all know that none of these people are creating millions and millions of garment waste in, in this country. So if you think about how, like, you know, this trade or this model of like consumption really affects women is right from the beginning, from garment workers right to the bottom when they are waste and can't move anywhere. Can I ask you, because we've had a couple of questions from, uh, from, from some people who are participating. Um, mm -hmm. When you talk about these clothes, are there microplastics or other things that deteriorate that get in the in the wastewater or in the in the water supply? Are there other things as the as the clothes deteriorate that cause health problems? Yes, that is very true. So part of our, our work here that we are currently doing is um, uh, toxicology, toxicology research, which we um, basically collect water samples from basically all the water bodies and beaches around um, the aqua space. And then like with our research so far, we found like microplastic in some of the water bodies that like, you know, around of um, Accra. And thinking about like talking about that, most of these like, um, spaces or water bodies are water bodies that people actually drink from. People actually have like, you know, their businesses exist in, in, in these spaces. So there are like traces of um, microplastics that have been found within um, these spaces as well. Okay. And um, Ryan, when you saw, when you first started exploring this, your reflections now on how big a problem this is, are you going through kind of an arc of learning on this? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I will ever see my clothing the same way again. Um, and, you know, like Sammy and I have been discussing, I mean, I think that's just a sort of psychological leap that we all need to make. You know, we need to slow down the consumption. We need to think about where things are coming from. And we need to think about how this apparently you know, I think fashion gets treated as a somewhat frivolous topic, not important, not a serious environmental issue, maybe not a serious labor issue. I think in part because it is an industry that so closely um, is, is linked to women, uh, you know, as Sammy was saying, both as the consumers, as the producers, et cetera. Uh, so it's sort of easy to kind of put off in a corner. It's not, it's not a big serious topic. Um, you know, it's something for fashion magazines, et cetera. Um, but, yeah, for me, I mean, just doing this reporting and thinking about this has made it a uh, sort of much more central question in my own life. Well, for me, I'm, you know, I'm a business editor, a health editor, and, and a foreign correspondent for a long time. And for me, this is an economic story. So I wonder if you can talk to me. When I, when I first read your pieces, I was thinking, oh, this is the U.S. sending its clothes. But does Europe does China, as wealth as wealth rises there and um, people have more money, are you seeing it coming from everywhere? Yeah, it comes from all over. I mean, I'll let Sammy speak to this a little bit because I think he he knows some of it, the stats better than I do. But you know, in in Joburg, you might see one person selling a bale from Australia, another person selling a bale from China. You can see by the brands, right, and the made in tags and stuff where these things are coming from. Often, um, from you know. Uh, Germany, from the U.S. So it, it is, it's coming from sort of everywhere that people have the means to consume conspicuously. Um, because I would say it's, you know, the issue is not necessarily people buying cheap clothes. You know, in many parts of the world, like for instance, in South Africa, a lot of people buy cheap clothes because that's what they can afford. But because that's what they can afford. They also take care of those clothes. You know, they mend them, um, they hand them down. Um, they're not the ones sort of buying this cheap stuff and then chucking it away. Um, but in sort of everywhere that there's kind of enough of a population with a lot of disposable income, that's where you start to see all this stuff coming from. But I'll let Sammy speak to that further. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's very true what Ryan just said. So we are seeing garments coming from like everywhere from the US, 
the Canada, Europe, UK, basically all, all parts of the world. And then like also very recently shifting very much into like, you know, China and Korea, clues coming there from, from there too. But I think for a longer period, the UK has been like the largest um, um, uh, export of clothing, um, second clothing into the Ghanaian space. And um, um, you said, Christine, you said something um, about like, you know, you seeing like this um, as an economic issue. And I think that is very, very true. Because if you look at like, you know, how like the disparity is in terms of people benefiting from like, like all of the money that this trade really comes out from and the people who are actually on the ground are not benefiting anything. It really makes it an economic issue. But then again, I think like as broad as it is, it makes it like an issue across the world. It's an economic issue, it's a social issue, it's um, a health issue. And it, it is also very much um, a political issue. It has very different ways that it sifts into like all of these things. And then for me, I think, and I know like a lot of like um, um, journalists and press people um, tuning into this conversation right now. And I think one of the things is also that there's so many pockets of, of this particular problem because it starts right from like, you know, like production field where like all of these um, fibers are made to garment workers, to like to the retail space, to all of these things. Like if you do a deep dive into all of these different pockets onto where the clothing arrive here, you can see that there's a lot of like, you know, um, um, extraction and exploitation that goes on around like um, this problem in general. So until we're able to connect all of these problems and make them like make people understand the line of this problem, we are not, you will never really get to understand the volume of the problem that we are seeing as it is right now. Because even though we are talking about you know, textile waste and then you know all of the, the, the garment waste that exists here in Africa, like for example in Lesotho and in Accra, there is the, also the problem of you know, garment workers not being paid and working in stress shops and all of that. There's also the same issue of, you know, like, you know, designers working in spaces where they are underpaid, they are working overtime and all of that. So there are so many like different pockets of issues that comes together to make this problem. But sometimes like it's been viewed in little pockets. So we don't really see the propensity of like the, the issue itself. But if you're able to connect, and I'm saying this because I know like there are a lot of journalists, as I said before, listening to this. And then if you had Ryan said, she's been able to connect it from a personal level, seeing like where all of this coding come from and then being able to understand the the issue on another level but if you see it as you know just like a garment workers problem or another consumption problem or a textile waste problem or you know boniwewu problem or dead one man's problem you they are all different problems but in the end they all come together in within the same um module or the same field are are there any big politicians or big families in ghana or other places that are behind the trade. I mean, what is the political power, or are there, you know, political pillars that yeah. allow this trade? And are there trade agreements between the nations that also promote this? Yeah, that, so, that I don't know about. Yeah. yeah. So um, I I say that like I can be specific on families or people that are influential. But one thing that I know is there are, there are people who are really making money out of this trade. And so for most of these people, they would rather keep it moving than like making it halt or pause at any time. And also when I talk about it being political, like um, Ghana is a country that was colonized for a very, a very long time. And to think that like all of these things that happen has like is deep rooted in colonialism. There are so many like, you know, um, political powers that exist be, like, you know, beyond like, you know, uh, leaders here so um we have countries like other african countries that have opted to ban secondhand clothing in, in entirely and they, they got like you know um clapbacks and then um responses on them being cut off in international agreements and trade um unions and things like that so if you think about the fact that you um you want to say like Ghanaians to say okay we don't want this clothing anymore here's the case the clothing coming from um, America, they are clothing coming from Canada, they are clothing coming from the Europe, they are clothing coming from the UK. And if you really think about it to like a deeper sense, these are waste that is coming into the country. So basically, Ghana and Cantamanto is basically serving as a waste management company for other countries. And then if this had existed in their own countries, it will cost them even more money to manage their own waste. But here's the case, they are profiting from their waste. 
So if you mm-hmm. think up, think about it in a deeper political sense, I don't think like any like greedy polit- politician, as we all know most of them to be, would allow this to just fade away, knowing very well how much they're benefiting from it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ryan, have you explored any of the, the trade agreements, the, 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 the political nature of the trade? I don't know if you have. Yeah, and you know, I think Sammy, Sammy was referencing a few years ago, a group of countries in East Africa got together and said that they were going to ban the import of secondhand clothes as a way to help um, grow their own textile industries or regrow them because a lot of African countries had textile industries previously and this flood of cheap clothes in is one of the things that destroyed them. Um, and so these countries kind of got together and said, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna ban secondhand clothes. And there was, in the United States, the textile recycling lobby um, came, basically came at them um, and came to the US government and said, um, you know, this will cut off our business at the knees. You can't do this. This, These these are our biggest markets. Um, And so the US went to these East African countries and said, if you do this, we will cut you off from, there's a trade agreement called AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunities Act, which gives a lot of African countries um, tax-free access to American markets for certain products. So it's very important for industries in those countries. And they said, we'll cut you off from a Goa if you ban the import of textiles, you know, which just speaks to what Sammy's saying about how it's not like countries want to accept the garbage of the West, you know, it's not in their interest to take our trash but they are literally being forced to. They have no other choice. They're being backed into a corner. Um, yeah, and so that's, I think that's a real good example of that. It's interesting. So we, uh, we have um, one of our uh, people in the audience, it's Sarah Friedman has asked how best to raise consciousness about this, especially the young girls, uh, maybe high school age. How do you get the message across? Um, I think that has been one of the, like um, questions I personally have always been so like one in my head around trying to find responses to because one thing that I, 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 I think I mentioned before is that like all of this problem is very very far away and very very separated from where the problem is actually coming from so I was in um, 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 Europe like a couple of months ago and for some meetings around work and the work that we're doing here. And it was very interesting that like, you know, I walked in, in the streets for, for about close to an hour and the whole time, the only pieces of waste or, that I saw was one plastic, bo- okay, two plastic bottles, one that I saw on the floor and then one that I had in my hand, basically two plastic bottles. So if you leave in a country like that, even if, for example, Ryan should do like a big documentary on all of this that we are talking about and put it out there. You may watch it. You may feel sad. Oh, this is really sad. Look at like all of these things happening in Africa and Ghana and everything. But the moment you step out into your own reality, it's very different from what you saw on the screen. So it only takes like a day or a couple of hours for you to like evaporate, for everything to evaporate from your head and not feel related to it anymore. So for me, I think one way to raise consciousness is having like real keen conversations with people that are around us. Like you don't need to have like, you know, a big platform to discuss these issues. Like you just need to act from your level of influence, which is something um, one of my colleagues say all the time, but it's really like being able to have the conversations. Like as Ryan has had like a whole epiphany about, about all of this through the pandemic, like it's not just about like her doing this research and putting her work down, but how on what level is, is she able to communicate with people, people within her cycle, her friends, her family about these conversations as well. Because when it comes to issues of consciousness, if you tell someone that this is a problem and so they should change their life, they're probably not gonna change it. They've, they've been living that, that life for basically their entire existence on this earth. So you don't expect like, you know, one conversation or one video on one, one magazine article to, to move their minds off of what they are used to already. But being conscious and making them, making um, engagement around these conversations like an everyday thing. For me, I think this is one way that we can push this forward because it's not a one person problem. It's the whole world's problem. You may not be seeing it in your country and you may be seeing it here, but when like um, um, climate crisis, you know, comes through, it affects the entire world, not just here. Mm -hmm. Ryan, do you have any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, this is a bit of a sideways answer to this, but one uh, thing that I learned about the fast fashion industry is because, because it's creating new styles at such a rapid rate, it's not actually creating new styles. It's kind of going back and recycling old styles. And this is why almost everything now that you see in fast fashion stores is a kind of almost a vintage replica from some era of vintage fashion because there's just not time anymore for designers to develop new styles and new styles and new styles to come out every week. Um, but what this means also is that almost any cool thing you would see in H&M or Zara or something that you'd want to buy, you can buy vintage, you know, you can buy vintage mom jeans and band t-shirts and, you know, all the things that are kind of popular and in style now um, exist in a secondhand form as well. And especially for consumers in the West, there's so, so many ways to buy secondhand clothes now. You know, there's all kinds of online platforms, there's vintage stores, there's, you know, Goodwills, like all the way down. There's just so many different ways that you can get clothes that aren't new and that are really cool and in style also. It's interesting to me. I mean, I think both of you are saying education about this needs to start early. And it might be something that the schools, you know, uh, should be addressing. But um, I also, because there's some journalists who are trying to figure out story ideas and how do you do this? And um, Ryan, when you first looked at this, did you have trouble selling it to editors as a story idea? Or did people grasp it right away? And how did you pitch it? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is a little tricky because, you know, any of, the, I mean, this is probably true with so many of the things that the Pulitzer Center supports, but anything that kind of reads as crisis or huge sad problem, people want to tune out of. It's like, you know, people just, it's, it's, it's difficult to engage with. It's hard to get readers to care away, care about these far away problems. Um, but I think the fact that there is a very direct link to our daily lives, if you're a Westerner, if you're wearing a pair of Levi's, then you have a connection to these women in Lesotho. You know, if you're taking your bag of old Zara stuff to a Goodwill, then you have a connection to these traders in Accra. Um, I think drawing those links um, and making it about brands that people care about, about you know um, the fashion industry which people care about, uh, that was sort of the 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 way that I think I was able to sell it or make it feel kind of quote unquote relevant to people. And and some some uh, listeners have been asking, is there a social media activism? Are there good sites for people to be following to? learn to read to to you know educate themselves well people should be following sammy's organization so i'll let him plug them <laughs> they are awesome on social media <laughs> well you can follow us definitely follow us on social media is um the or foundation that is the or foundation but once again i think that um sustainable and like you know um the sustainable fashion community is really, really growing online. And there's so many podcasts, magazines, you know, Instagram pages, Facebook, Twitter pages that like are built just to like, you know, um, put out information and then put out education on all of these topics. So if you really open yourselves up, like there are so many um, um, platforms out there that can teach you a whole lot. And beyond teaching then, how do you put pressure yeah, you know, what sites help people pressure corporations to get involved or politicians to make changes? Are there, I sometimes feel that Twitter is very helpful for governments and for politicians because people vent mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. they don't do. Yeah. So are, you know, what's the next step beyond education? What, what can you do? Who are like-minded people who have organizations that actually apply pressure? Um, I think one of the things that as an organization we have been pushing and putting pressure on having conversation around a lot right now is um, EPR policies. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So EPR is um, extended producer responsibility policies. And what this means is that like for every brand that produces clothing, for every garment that you made, you're going to like put down some taxes or some pennies that will sort of like manage the waste for 
after the it has been produced, after the consumer has used it. And right now, France is the only country that has such policies. But the way the policy exists, it only exists for the money to stay in France. But here's the case here in Ghana, we are seeing the kind of coding that is coming from France. So how do we push like other countries to build on these policies to, to make sure that there is money following the waste that they are sending to other people's countries? And so, as I said before, most of these platforms that I mentioned are like are, um, actively pushing towards like having conversations around it, all, of, all of that. But as I said before, I feel like it's always so strong when you have conversations on a very personal level, because now we, we have gotten into the world, we are talking about fast fashion, but there's also the issue of fast media and fast information, whereby like, you know, statistics are not really like looked into, everybody posts anything out there because everybody has power beyond, beyond, behind their own keyboards and behind their own screen, so they can put anything out there. But, you know, having real conversations, imagine like Christine calling a friend and saying, oh, hello friend, um, how are you doing? I want to talk to you today about a conversation I had with um, Ryan and Sammy about consumption of clothing and the problem Global North is causing in, in Ghana. That will take it to a deeper level than, you know, you posting like, you know, two sentences on Twitter. I personally think it's always like a deeper point to connect on a human level than to make it like, you know, all about what you can put behind the screens and everything. Because we have, while well, social media and all of these things are good, but we have almost gotten to a point where it doesn't have the strength of connection as it used to have before. And we're we're about we have about four minutes left, and mm -hmm. and um, as some another attendee has asked a very proper question: What is your advice for people to figure out what to do with their leftover clothes? What should they be doing? <laughs> okay, so first of all, one thing that I always say to people is that like is also always being conscious about the clothing that you're having. Um, first of all, like all of these clothing that you, you have so far, what other users can you make out for them? Um, there's so many like YouTube, as right now I'm talking from a normal fast fashion lab there, you can see, but this is like a, like a, a rag or a seat mat that is made out of like basically waste t-shirt that has been woven into pieces. There are so many crafty things that you could do from this way. And even if you're not crafty, your old t-shirt can be used as a rag to mop your kitchen and to wipe your your cabinets and all of that. So it's just about us like being real creative about ways that we can use this clothing and not making the first result donating or you know trashing it or sending it to a recycle bin. And even around the idea of donating, if it's something that you wouldn't give to a loved one or a friend or a family or something that you wouldn't buy, why are you giving it to anybody? And also the idea of donation really means kindness. So if you're putting something out there that has a, a stain in it, that has a hole in the pit, that has like a ruined neckline, are you being kind? That's the question you should ask yourself. Thank you so much. Ryan, do you have any ideas? That was excellent, Sammy. Thanks so much. Uh, Ryan, any anything to add? No, I think I think he he basically got it. You know, I would say when you're like like he said, if you're looking to donate things, if donating is sort of your last and best option, mend things before you donate them, wash things before you donate them. Like he said, like Sammy said, you know, make it so that it's in a condition that you would give to a friend um, and not just something you're throwing away. Well, this has been terrific. And and for people who are attending and listening, um, Sammy and Ryan are always available <laughs> as your experts. <laughs> so, um, and I'll give it now to Michaela. Yes, and on that note, I shared these links in the chat as well, but just to learn more about what Ryan and Sammy are doing. Um, we appreciate all of you and our audience for joining us today, and for those of you who are able, please consider becoming a Pulitzer Center champion to support our work. Finally, a brief survey is going to follow the end of this webinar. We appreciate you taking the time to help us improve our events and give us some feedback. Thank you again to our panelists and to everyone who joined us today, um, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Bye.